All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jos Bortvliet. Uh, I've been around open source for a very long time. I uh, did KDE marketing and promo stuff early 2000s. I worked for SUSE as community manager. I worked for OwnCloud as community manager. And now I'm at Nextcloud doing this private cloud stuff. Now, my boss just said today that I'm probably the marketing guy who knows more about crypto than any other marketing guy he knows. It's probably true. I'm not a developer, though. So there are limits to what I know. In that case, I will probably play a uh, help card on one of the developers that we have. But I know at least the concept and principles behind it. That's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's therefore reasonably technical. So I have about 50 minutes. I think the talk will be, I don't know, 30 if I talk really quick. Um, but if you have questions at any time, just interrupt me. I'll guessing that that will fill up the rest of the time. So I'll start a bit with Nextcloud in general because I'm, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with it. And then I will basically go into the, well, encryption again, high level, big picture. But then we'll dive into the requirements that we defined for the Nextcloud end to end encryption. And then I'll go into the design itself. That's a real fun part. So quickly, Nextcloud. And and for a technical audience who is probably aware of the whole privacy thing with Facebook and Google su sucking up all your data and, well, selling it or using it to make money and the, press the issues with that. So I'll just jump to Nextcloud is designed or developed as kind of a solution for that. That's what we're trying to build here. A way to keep your data to yourself, to provide an alternative to the big players of Google and Microsoft with Office 365, etc. Something you can host yourself. So it's essentially a file sync and share solution. You host on your own server, either at home on the Raspberry Pi, although you need a little more power than that, unless you just use it on your own. Uh, you can also, of course, host it at a provider, either a provider who provides Nextcloud. Uh, Hetzner here in Germany, for example, provides Nextcloud, and many other companies do. Or at a VPS, or even just at an old laptop or desktop that you just put in your living room behind your couch, which is what I did and do for a long time. So it gives you the same stuff. You can sync and share files with other people. You can edit documents online with other people using LibreOffice Online slash Collabora Online or only Office. You can share between Nextcloud servers, um, just add somebody's name on another server um, in the share dialog and you just send a request to their server. They will receive the file, can accept it and you can seamlessly share between servers. And you can have audio, video calls and chat while you're editing a document, for example, or just you know, use the mobile app to call somebody and they can then pick up on their phone, but the call actually goes for your Nextcloud server and is completely secure. Again, it all takes a little bit of setup, but you get a very nice self-hosted private cloud that does everything the big boys do, pretty much. So, because again, a lot of people here are technical and some of them are a bit older, so I thought I'd go for a little bit of history of like what the background is behind this whole thing, and I'm going to start with this fun one. Um, so I, I want to provide a bit of, I don't know, big picture here of what we're trying to build and why. So a lot of people often ask us about, you know, why are you adding this? Why are you doing that? So these guys in 1993, they released a network drive. Yeah, you, you, as a sysadmin, you can you add users to it, you give them a bit of space where they can share files with other people. For a big company, this was probably really, really good. A lot of productivity came out having this network drive. It's of course hierarchical and very much controlled by IT. The IT guys, they set who has access to what and when and how. So that changed when these guys came and released Dropbox. It's essentially kind of a network drive 2.0. Suddenly, you can sync files so you have them available offline. You can sync files so you have them when you're not at the office. And you don't need to go to the sysadmin to get new people added to a group. You can just share files with them and you don't have any headaches of like management overhead. Of course, it was designed for home users, so it's a bit of a problem in a big company with security and all that stuff. But for all of us at home, at least, it's awesome. Then these guys came. And they did another step on top of that. They basically turned the network drive into a collaboration platform. 
Yeah, you can have all the other things, but you can add the documents together. You can do collaborative editing. You have chat, video calls, etc. But all of that is, of course, on their servers. And that's essentially what we're trying to replace. Provide a place where you can work with other people, but you run it on your own server and keep your data under control. Give the same stuff, but it's completely open source. Easy to use, of course. It needs to have all the same features. It needs to have be as easy to use. That's what we're building, and we're doing pretty okay. Um, there are a lot of other projects that do open source, self-hosted file sync and share. We are, at least if you look at the Google Trends, the biggest by far. There are also a lot of proprietary players like Citrix and FileCloud. And well, we're bigger than them too, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah, that was, I think that I just took that picture, so that's nice. Of course, if you then compare us to the really big players, you know, we're not really making a dent. So while I'm very happy with how we're done in the last couple of years, we still have a lot of work to do because these are the guys we really want to replace. Yeah, privacy, sadly, is something most people just don't care about enough. At least not as much as I think they should. All right, that, that's the next loud part. Let's get to the juicy part. So the goal of encryption is of course to provide extra protection for your data. And it only works if you have a good idea of what you're trying to protect from. Yeah, so I'm gonna get into the risk models uh, or threat models in a few minutes. But in Nextcloud, there are a number of types of encryption already being used. Uh, there's encryption in transit, that's basically done by SSL. There is encryption at rest when the data is stored on the server. And there is the client side or end-to-end -end encryption that we have developed and are still, well, finalizing. So I'm gonna skip the in-transit part because, well, the whole point of in-transit encryption is HTTPS is to protect you from somebody who is trying to snoop on your network traffic between the server and the client. I think this is a pretty well-known tech, so I'm not gonna spend much time on it. Our threat model, as in the thing we try to protect from on the server side encryption is insecure storage. So let's say you run a Nextcloud server at your office, but your storage is Amazon S3. You don't want Amazon to know the data that you have. Then you can use our server side encryption. So whenever a client via the web interface or one of the apps uploads a file to the Nextcloud server, it gets encrypted on the Nextcloud server. The key stays on the Nextcloud server but the encrypted data is stored at Amazon S3. And when you access a file, it gets downloaded from Amazon, decrypted, and goes back to you. In other words, you're protected from Amazon, but you're not protected from whoever has access to the Nextcloud server. Yeah? The other nice thing about it is the data, depending on which exact way you use our end-to-end -end or server-side encryption, so it has a couple of, well, configuration knobs, but it is possible also to protect against hardware theft. So obviously if the drives get stolen, that data should be encrypted. I recommend you simply use full disk encryption, but if you don't, you can also use our server side encryption to encrypt files on the server itself and have the key encrypted by the user password, which means it's not available when the user isn't logged in. In other words, if you unplug the server, then an attacker who steals the drives cannot get access to the data. And last but not least, of course, if a breach is detected quick enough before the attacker can download all the data, and even if they download part of it, it's encrypted, as long as the keys weren't snatched in that time, you're still okay. So it also can help against the breach if it's detected long enough. So this has been a part of Nextcloud uh, security for a long time, the server-side encryption. And well, if you're interested in it, you can come talk to me. There are some trade-offs there to be had as well, but it is an option. Now, let's say you're worried actually about the server itself. Uh, you're using maybe a private hoster, or uh, you just don't trust your sysadmin, or you don't want to tr have to trust your sysadmin. Uh, if you're a company, 
um, and you run a lot of medical data or you have um, the HR department and you want them to use it. Like a use case for us was from the TU Berlin and they told us, look, you know, our HR department is still only using paper because we don't want to have the, that the sysadmins have access to the uh, resumes of people who, you know, want a job at the university. So we keep those all on physical paper so that, you know, only the people working with them have access to that information. So they want an end-to-end -end encryption so that also the sysadmins would not even theoretically have access to this information. Yeah, so it doesn't even have to be an evil sysadmin, just a sysadmin. And of course, it happens regularly that people hack servers are in there for several years before it gets detected. Uh, for some data, you want to protect against that, obviously. So out of this look at the, the risks we wanted to deal with, we basically put together requirements. Again, questions at any time, eh? always welcome. So the thing our end-to-end -end encryption is supposed to protect from is a complete and full compromise of the server. If an evil person or at least a non-trusted person has complete control over the server, they should never be able to get at the content of your files, period. That was our first requirement. And the second is that it's easy to use because pretty much always the problem with security is the human using it. They are the weak chain and we try to eliminate that as much as possible. And I'll go over how we do that, um, but that was an important point. Now, there are of course some downsides if you do this. You lose certain functionality. Um, so our goal was to have at least uh, folder level sharing. Doesn't have to be to groups, although actually currently we're looking at doing that anyway. Um, we want to make sure that only authorized users have access to the files. And even if you have access to them as in on the server and you tamper with them, it should of course be known by the user that there was tampering with the files and you shouldn't be able to get away with making changes that go undetected. We wanted to use widely used libraries for the encryption and decryption part so that we didn't have to implement crypto ourselves because that's, well, problematic. So we tried to limit ourselves to using algorithms that were implemented in libraries on iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, Linux, and PHP 7. We found those, luckily. Uh, we wanted to have a central recovery mechanism because whenever you ask a company, you know, like they come to you, they say, hey, we want end-to-end -end encryption. Then you say, okay, nice. Uh, and what happens when your employee leaves the company? Do you want to have access to the data? And they say, yes, we do. Okay, but you know, you can't. That's the point of client-side encryption. So we need some kind of recovery plan for that some kind of way of getting files back without keeping it on the server. So we made a solution for that. Users are warned of this and it's only used for new data after the change is made and the users are warned. But still, it's there. Uh, we want all devices to get access, of course, to the data with as little configuration work for the user as possible. And we want sharing to be as easy as possible as well. Last but not least, we wanted versioning in the protocol so we can fix bugs. All right, it's a big list. Um, then a couple of key principles. I already alluded to this one. Users are, well, I don't want to say stupid, but not terribly clever. At least that's what we assume. So we assume users to make mistakes, and we also assume the sysadmin not to. I know that's also a stretch, but you know, the bug has to stop somewhere. Um, so we make key handling easy. Um, with password handling, for example, we don't let the user choose a password. We generate the password and tell it to the user. We tell them to write it down and then assume that they don't do that. Because, you know, when does a user do what you tell them to do? Right? Th this is just to make clear. That's how we implemented this principle. Yes? Um, so he asked if we are using two-factor authentication for this. Um, we don't because it's on device. So I'll, I'll get into the details. I think this will become clear later on. Um, this, here it makes no sense, I think. 
So we want the key recovery mechanism also, because as I said, we tell the users to write down the password or the key that we give them, but we assume they don't. So we provide a very ubiquitous recovery mechanism. On the enterprise side, I mean, you need the data recovery, as I already mentioned. Uh, you need audit auditing, so you need to not know what's in the files, because you can't, but you should at least know who shared what with who. So that, for example, if there is data theft at your company, you can say, well, you know, this file is stolen and it was accessed on that date by those people. So at least you have some way of tracking down these things. This is, of course, a hard requirement for companies. And this obviously also means that some information about the files is available to the server. It's the content we protect as well as the name, but not necessarily, you know, who is shared with, etc. These things are leaked. And we're okay with that. If you're not, use another end-to-end -end encryption mechanism. Yeah. And last, HSM support, so hardware security module. Again, in the companies. Um, so feature-wise, if you start to do end-to-end -end encryption, the first thing that you lose is a web interface. Because, just in case, because I know that this is being cheated with all the time, you can't have a web interface if you want client-side encryption, because a web browser isn't a client. I mean, it is in, in some ways, but it's executing code coming from the server. If you don't trust the server, you can't trust the code coming from the server either. Therefore, using code from the server to decrypt files, that's pointless. Just use HTTPS and don't bother. End-to-end uh, -end encryption in the browser is just nonsense. Well, it's not a word for HTTPS if you just define the server as one end and the client as the other end and then it's end-to-end. -end. Yeah, but what we're trying to build here is something that protects you from the server. That means you can't have a web interface. You can't edit the files. You can't collaborate on the files. You don't have access to the content, period. It also means no public sharing. Now you can share with other users because we use public private key, but you can't share with a public link because, well, that means that the server has to provide that external user a web interface access to the files. That immediately, by definition, breaks end-to-end -end encryption. So we don't support that. Just put it in an unencrypted folder because that's essentially what we did. Uh, the way we implemented this is you don't have end-to-end -end encryption for all your data on Nextcloud. Instead, you pick one or multiple folders, and the data in those folders is end-to-end -end encrypted. They then show a lock in the web interface on the server when you log into the web interface, and the server has no access to the content, so you don't have a web interface for that. So what you don't want is use this for all your files, because everything Nextcloud does, from handling versions to trash, to online document editing, to showing it via public link, all of that disappears. Yeah? There's no point in using Nextcloud if you want all your files end-to-end -end encrypted. There are better solutions out there for you. However, if among all your files there is one or two folders that you want to be ultimate, uh, to have the ultimate protection, yeah, to keep those from the server, that is what Nextcloud end-to-end -end encryption is for. Those folders we can secure for you in a way that the admin can never get to. That's what it does. So it can sync between devices mobile phone, uh, tablet, laptop, desktop. And again, no web interface. And you can share, but only on a folder level. So you can share one folder, but you cannot share individual files in them. You either share the whole folder with another user or not at all. What you can't do, as I said, the web interface, no trace, no versions, no search, no previews, no groups, and you can't share single files. This is all gone. Again, don't use Nextcloud if you want to use end-to-end -end encryption for all your files. There's really no point. And all the good stuff goes away. Federated sharing is in theory possible, but we haven't really even started implementing that yet. So federated sharing is sharing between Nextcloud servers. And in theory, it should be possible to have an end-to-end -end encrypted folder and share it to a user on another server and have the whole thing stay end-to-end -end encrypted and with no data leaks to the server. It should be possible, but we haven't really implemented any of that yet. All right, so this is what it's gonna do, and I'm gonna talk now about how it does it, but I first wanna ask if there are any questions. No? Am I going too fast, too slow? 
All right, I guess it's good then. Let's go into it. So the first thing you need to do with our end-to-end -end encryption is you need to create an identity. Now, the first time you basically enable end-to-end -end encryption, this will be done. And I'm going to go over the steps of creating an identity and then adding other devices so that they can sync the files. So step one is to create the identity. And this, this is basically an X509 certificate request with a public and private key. Um, so the client generates a certificate request and a private key. The server signs the certificate and the private key is stored in the keychain of the device. Then we gonna sync the identity to the server because the other clients will have to get your private key. Now obviously you don't want the server to get access to the content of the private key because well that's the thing that gives you access to everything. So what we do is we create a 12 word mnemonic, so 12 words from a dictionary of about 3000 plain English words. We show them to the user, we ask the user to write them down and we assume the user doesn't. So we also store them in the keychain in the device and we encrypt the private key with these, this mnemonic of 12 words and upload it to the server. So at this point we have the private key on the device in plain text. We have it on the server encrypted with the mnemonic which we also have on the device locally. Of course there's also a public key. Yes? Sorry, I mean you said that 3,000 words in dictionary up to 12 words? Yes. It's five characters. Each word has five characters. We use it as a string. It doesn't matter. Can you get back or at least five. You get back to the 70 bits of entropy from that. So that means that you're reducing the security level of the whole thing to 70 bits. Um, so let me see. You. I come to me later because. There is something here missing, but I don't know um, out of on the top of my head. Because I think it is 12 words from the dictionary with each, of course, a random length with at least five characters. So you have to figure out from the long list of characters what word it is. So something I think is wrong with your math, but maybe I'm wrong. But I, I let, let's talk about that later, OK? OK. So now you have the private key on the server encrypted with the mnemonic um, and you have one device. You want to add a second device. Let's say you have an enabled end-to-end -end encryption on your phone. Now you want to enable it on your laptop. So you go to your laptop and you say, OK, enable end-to-end -end encryption or it prompts you because it sees that it is enabled now and there's an encrypted folder. It downloads the encrypted private key and asks you for the mnemonic. Um, well, you enter the mnemonic, you can either ask your mobile phone to show it, we will at some point probably add some QR code way of exchanging this as well. Um, of course the device checks if the private key belongs to the certificate and is properly signed and it's all stored in the keychain of the device. Note that we use trust on first use with all of this and that comes back later as well with sharing we also use trust on first use. So now you have two devices that both have the private key, well the public key is on the server anyway. Uh, so they have, they can both encrypt and decrypt files. So let's create a new folder, enable end-to-end -end encryption, add files. Um, we do this in a dual layered way. So we encrypt all the files with AES, I think 256, generating a file key for each of the files. Then these file keys are stored in a metadata file and this metadata file also has the name of the file. The file gets a random UUID and the metadata file is then encrypted again uh, with the public and private key. The reason we do these two layers is that when you share with someone else, you just need to re-encrypt the metadata file because all the other stuff is then accessible from there you don't need to re-encrypt and re-upload all the individual files because that would be a big pain in the ass if you're sharing with a dozen people. Yes. Yes. Well, you... 
Um, sorry? Sorry, so for every user there's a private and public key pair and you encrypt to the public key, I think, uh, and then they use the private key to decrypt. And if you, have, if you share with other users, then you encrypt the metadata file also to the public key of the other user so that they can then decrypt it with their private key. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I wasn't entirely clear on that. But yes, that's the mechanism we use. All right. And the server then will know the approximate the number of files, and it knows their size. But because on every change of the file, we basically delete the file and upload a new one with a new UUID, the server has a hard time tracking what file changes. Although, of course, with a bit of heuristics, they can still figure that out most of the time. But it's hard to prevent uh, here. All right, let's go through the details. So step one, we create a folder, enable end-to-end -end encryption. So we create a folder and mark it to the server as encrypted. Then we create a metadata file and a metadata key, which is encrypted to all the public keys that have access to the folder. So the metadata key is used to encrypt all values in the metadata file. And the metadata file is then encrypted, stored encrypted on the server. To create a new file, the user adds a file in the folder. We generate an AES256 key, encrypt the file with it. We generate a random UUID, uh, upload the encrypted file named to the UUID to the server, and use the random identifier as the file name, add the file to the files array in the metadata file with a link to the UUID, so that you have the match between file name, uh, UUID, and then the file key. And then we re-encrypt the metadata and upload it to the server again. Essentially, now you have your files. So, well, to access files, uh, so let's say your laptop now has to grab these files. Uh, we go over that. Um, we, I'll talk about sharing here in a minute. And as I said, we use trust on first use for the user identities again as well. All right, so your laptop now wants to download the files that were uploaded by your phone. It starts by downloading the metadata of the encrypted folder. It uses the private key to decrypt the metadata key and uses then the metadata key to decrypt the files array. So it has access to the file names, UUIDs, and file keys. Downloads all the files and then uses the metadata to decrypt the files locally. Uh, rename the files with the file names, and now you have all the files also on your laptop. Sharing. So now let's say um, you want to share with another user. Uh, in the share dialog, you simply type the name. Your client will ask the server for that user and get back, well, here's the username indeed, and here is... Um, the certificate of the user. This is signed by the server. We store it locally and we don't look for it again. So if somebody tries to impersonate the user, that's not going to work because we stored the certificate. And if the other user then tries to create a new certificate for that user, we're going to ignore that. We don't even look for it anymore. Um, Obviously, we verify then if the certificate is issued by the server, we store it locally, um, create a new metadata key, encrypt it to the recipient's public key, use that to re-encrypt uh, the metadata file, and upload the updated metadata to the server. The sharing works just via the usual OCS sharing API that Nextcloud uses. There's, so there's basically nothing special here. To unshare, you simply remove the share via the OCS API on the Nextcloud server. You create a new metadata key and encrypt to the people who now have access, minus the person you wanted to remove. Upload the new metadata to the server and, well, going forward, the user will not have access to changes that are made. That's basically the whole thing. Um, I'll go over a couple of these in a minute, but let's first ask if there are any questions about the stuff until now. 
Yeah, um, the client is checks basically. Um, I don't know the exact name of the algorithm we use, uh, also because it's a stupidly complicated name. I didn't even bother to put it on, but it should basically warn if there is a issue if a file is changed and not properly re-encrypted. So the authenticity we check by verifying the certificate uh, and the user's public key. Uh, yes. Let me see. Uh, so the server signs the um, certificate that is connected to the public key. So the server kind of verifies the identity. Obviously, if the server is compromised from day one, then you might not want to trust that. But who made it? Yeah, because, well, assuming that the user is the only one who has access to the private key, then that they're the only one who could have encrypted it. Is that wrong? Let me see. No, you're right. Um, I need to look that up too, how we do that. I know we, we try to check that, but I don't remember how. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're sitting over there, um, one of the ships, basically, the next cloud uh, ship. So c come and ask, because th there is an answer to that, but I, um, I don't know. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, yes. Yes. I would like to use Nextop server to share and sync uh, calendars and contacts between users and different devices. Yes. Share it, do that to the host, have it discuss with the administrator of Nextop. Um, okay, so what he's asking is can you also share end to end encrypted uh, calendars and contacts? That's what it boils down to, right? Yes. Uh, so the thing with that is that no existing client supports that because the protocol doesn't support it. Therefore, you would have to write new applications that support it and then implement something like that. We haven't implemented calendar and contacts apps for all mobile platforms. Eh? We use the existing standard so that you can use existing apps. Um, you know, if you give us money for 60 people, sure. But this is a pretty big task. I'm not saying it's impossible. It just would simply mean developing calendar and contacts apps, or at least syncing uh, providers like DevDroid. Um, so it would be possible, but it's just something we, we haven't looked at yet. Um, also because, of course, you lose the web UI, which is nice uh, for a lot of that stuff. So no, not at the moment. Possible theory, yes but not on the radar for us. Any more questions? Yeah. For Nextcloud, um, it's regular password authentication. Uh, you can use anything like SAML and Kerberos and all that stuff and do factor authentication, the whole list, including signal as second factor if you want, or um, notification on existing device that's really nice so when you log in then you can say okay use an existing device to approve and then you get this notification on your phone that says hey device from ip address blah wants to log in approve or deny yeah but um that's a question i don't know the answer to um again come by i'm not sure if someone has the answer to that one actually but they might um, all right, a couple of other things. So one thing that I mentioned is a key recovery. Um, yeah, it does happen, of course, especially with a company that people leave or, you know, I don't know, airplanes crash and cars hit into people, etc. Or an employee loses all their devices, which is pretty annoying, but it can happen. And, and as you noticed back then, yes, we tell the user to write down the mnemonic, hopefully not in a little post-it note on their screen. Um, but if they don't, and they don't have any of their devices, then it's lost. Now, because we use trust on first use, that means the account is literally burned. Uh, anyone you've ever shared with, you will not be able to share with any more from that same user account. This is annoying, there's a workaround for it um, with the HSM, but otherwise it's something you have to accept. Interestingly enough, at least one university, when we told them that, told us, oh, that's awesome, that means no help desk work. We just tell them, sorry, you're fucked. 
that's one way of dealing with it. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, but that that's a consequence of this model, right? Um, but if you lose data, at least you can recover it. So what we do here is basically we allow for an offline recovery key. It's essentially just another private public key pair that's generated offline. Then the public key is uploaded to the server and all the files are encrypted against that public key as well. Um, and then as a company, you can decide how to protect the private key. For example, I don't know, write it on four pieces of paper and you know, give each piece to one system admin or whatever process you want. Put it in the safe and have you know three people need a key. Um, but that can then be used to recover files in an individual case for an individual user. It's quite a pain in the ass, of course, to do then. It's complete manual. Um, so yeah, it, it's not a way of like, look, I forgot my password, can you reset it? That's just not how it works. But in a bad case, this can be done. Our clients are supposed to warn the user when this recovery key is enabled. And the recovery key doesn't give you access to anything that was uploaded before uh, until the moment it's enabled. So again, if you're an evil sysadmin um, that enables this recovery key to get access to the old data, you can't. Of course, if the users ignore the warning and proceed, then you will get access to all the files that are modified from that date going forward. Hopefully, at least one of the people in your organization will notice their phone just told them you know, that the recovery key is enabled and will say, oh, wait, guys, what happened? If not, then, yeah. Um, there's that. Well, so the HSM can actually deal uh, with new identities because you can use it as a trusted way to issue certificates and then modify the clients to actually check for new ones as long as they're signed with the HSM. If you trust that, then you can actually do the recovery of accounts if you want. Um, yeah, that university clearly wasn't interested in that. I told them it was an option. They were like, nah, too much work. But um, it's possible. At least in theory, this isn't implemented yet. And that's when we get to the roadmap. Um, well, actually, I haven't updated the remote roadmap. Um, but it's, it's released, but it's still yeah not not entirely stable uh it's been ta taken a lot longer than we had expected to be honest surprisingly hard especially for the desktop client um because of the whole syncing part which complicated it but right now we have it in the client the desktop client and the mobile clients you can use it i wouldn't trust a whole lot of data to it uh, the main downside right now it wouldn't lo lose data um, it's it's pretty reliable. We haven't had any data loss issues for quite a while. However, it is slow. Uh, the problem is that, uh, well, Nextcloud being a PHP app needs to fire up the whole universe of PHP for every request. So when you're syncing a lot of files and each of these files is a separate request and that takes a lot of time and effort. So what our desktop client normally does is it parallelizes that and uploads six, 10 files at the same time. But the end-to-end -end encryption actually requires you to first lock the folder, then uh, upload the metadata, the new, upload the file, and unlock the folder. So instead of one request per file that you can do 10 at a time, you need four requests per file, one at a time. So the performance impact of the end-to-end -end encryption is really significant. If you have large amounts of small files, don't. Because it'll be very, very slow. We will look at ways of doing multiple uploads per time that you lock. Right now, that's just not possible. But of course, there's no theoretical reason why it isn't, um, except that it's annoying for concurrent uh, uploading, of course. Um, but we will be working on this going forward. But at the moment, yeah, that's, uh, that's a serious downside. There's a bug right now that, uh, with the desktop client, at least, subfolders are not encrypted it's a pretty serious one so careful it should hopefully be fixed in uh, the next bug fix release but you know again it's still maturing and sharing isn't possible at the moment either it's just syncing between your devices so again we're still getting this um, done 
Are there any more questions? I mean, you can download a, a white paper with a lot more details there. Um, but of course, also just come by our boat there and ask all the questions you have. But if there are questions now, then um, yeah, shoot. Nothing? Then I'm done. Have a wonderful day, everyone.